I appreciate you guys. We're in a fun series here, and um, thank you for being tolerant with us and working with us as we work through. I know the masks are a pain in the butt, but this is what we do say we're a pro-life church. That means even wearing a mask, that we're just protect one another. I, I want to say something, and this may be a little bit weird, but I'm going to say it. I do want you to know I had COVID, and what we don't hear in the news, there's two extremes. People saying it's not real, it is real. I had it. And, but on the other hand, what you don't hear is most people recover from it and are fine through it. So I don't want you to be led by fear, but part of the thing we do in church, we're just wearing a mask because we're just saying, hey, even if you hate it, nobody hates wearing a mask worse than me. Trust me. And I have like 300 masks and I do all sorts of crazy things in my mask, but we wear it just to protect other people. And it's not going to kill you to wear it for a little bit, especially when you're walking around and doing all that. But thank you. We appreciate you. And and all that. I don't know why God's allowing this to happen. I do know this God's getting our attention. Amen. And you know, many of us just want to go back to what we thought was normal, but I don't think God's going to let us go back right now because we haven't learned our lesson yet. Yeah. And I think God's got our attention. It's time for us to wake up and realize there's no promise of tomorrow and we're messing around. Amen. So I'll leave that alone. I'm going to do something really good today. I'm going to be very, very teachy today, and it's going to be very simple, but I, our, our, our subject this morning is what will you look like in heaven? I'm going to demystify the story because many of you have the stupidest ideas. And here's what everybody always says. Well, I think, well, I don't really care what you think. What does the Bible say? Because you may think you're going to be like the Sylvania light bulb commercial and run around as in, or just float on a cloud twiddling your thumbs or whatever that may be. So before I start, the, the, you know, some of the most asked questions are this. What will I look like? Will I know my family, and will my pets make it to heaven? And as crazy as that sounds, that's really, really true. And I will answer some things about pets, but we got started last week on a pet. We're just going to do one more fun little thing. Last week, you seen the video of Leo introducing himself and telling us a story of asking about um, pets. And I made, the, I made a, sometimes as a pastor, you say really dumb things that later on you realize I should have said that. And I said, I don't know if cats go to heaven, but I took a lot of heat. <laughs> and um, so this week, um, we found some evidence that cats at least do pray. And then my little dog, Deacon Brown, was upset because he was not on the video. So if you'll do it for me, one last video of what our pets have to say. Hey, y'all. It's your girl, Tilly, here. I'm so glad that you're joining us for our series on heaven. I'm so excited. Woo! We all know us dogs go to heaven, but do those silly cats go to heaven too? At the very least, we know they pray. Father God, in the matchless name of Jesus, we come against that stray spirit in your life. Come on in here. You got a home in heaven and you got a home on earth. Huh? Your nine lives shall be given to God. Huh? Heathcliff, Heathcliff, no one should huh? terrorize his neighborhood. Ha -ha. There's a home for you right now. Walk in your season. Come on, Garfield. Step out of there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What the heck is going on in the church? You don't know that I am animal number one here at PVC. Number one. Number one. Numero uno, baby. By the way, you shall have no other animals before me. Just kidding, TVC. But don't do it again. I know one thing. I'm saved, I'm born again, and heaven is my destination. Yeah, so the dogs have something to say. I, this morning, am going to attempt to demystify for you. I want to say to you, simply, the, I'm just going to give you some very practical truths that Paul laid out before us. But before I can, you have to realize what you see right here, there's more than that in, this, in, in eternity. Particle physics, scientific ways, say that there are 11 dimensions that are actually exist. We just can't reach all of them. We know we live in three, right? You have what? Length and width, the depth. You have the three. And some, say, some include time in that is in our dimension that we can only reach. But I'm telling you there's more. Paul himself experienced it. While writing, Paul said, I went to the third heavens. I seen things that I'm not even allowed to write about. But I'm telling you it's real. Paul said, I'm not even sure if I was in my earthly body or my heavenly body, but I'll tell you one thing, I was there, my friend. 
You know, for us to say, well, I don't see it, I don't know, I'm not sure, is really a huge mistake. It's like a little fish that's born in the ocean, and you're born out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and you think that all you see is the water and the other fish until one day you bite this worm and he pulls you up out of the water and you see a whole nother dimension that you have never seen before. One day you will be pulled up into another dimension and I would like to prepare you today and get you to a place where we're not scared of moving into that other dimension. The other dimension is real. The Bible is very clear about it and it's actually not that deep. It's very simple. If we will just open ourselves up to the word and what God has to say, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the meat of the whole subject, and Paul teaches about this. Here's the problem. That chapter is so in-depth that as you read it, it's easy to forget what you were reading because Paul's walking you through some steps, and Paul was very sophisticated. I think Paul was probably very nerdy, and I mean, he was like, and, and I, think it, I think it reads a little bit difficult, honestly. I think it reads just a bit difficult. Here's the, if you just don't read it verse by verse, it can get confusing. So I'm going to attempt just to break in the middle of it so I can clear up something. Then I'm going to use some examples that you can see, just see. And I'm going to give you a couple Greek words that are very important. But actually, I'm not going to teach much. I'm just going to let the word speak for itself this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44. Paul simply says this truth. He's teaching about when you die and you're resurrected. He's teaching about the bodies. And he says, your body's sown a natural body and it's raised a spiritual body. Here's where I'm going. Watch this. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Yes, sir. Don't think that your heavenly body is just going to be this big blob of light. Actually, your spiritual body is the body you will live in through eternity. Now, there is benefits of exercising now and taking care of your body now. The Bible does say bodily exercise profits a little bit. But I want you to know something. The body you're in right now, one day, it's corrupt and it's going to die. It's going to wrinkle. And don't spend all your time working on this thing because one day it's going to be buried and it's done. And you're going to wake up in a spiritual body, a real body, a real place, and you ought to know more about that or understand about that even than living in this physical earth. This physical body, I mean, I wake up every day and find a wrinkle I never had yesterday. <laughs> and it goes quick and you just start all of a sudden you can't step as high or like, like when I get up out of bed and I like have to actually grab something because, and I'm like, man, I'm just getting, but that's what Paul said, our body will decay. But don't give up hope. Because there's going to be a day you're going to be pulled up into a whole other dimension and you're going to live in a spiritual body. So the question is, what does that spiritual body look like? I don't want any mysticism or any just goofy ideas or you think or I don't care about what you think. I'm telling you the word's very clear and gives us a lot of truth about our spiritual body. If you will allow me, Philippians 3, 20 through 21, Paul again writing. Paul writes this. I love this passage. Paul says... My microphone's a little bit crooked here. I'm sorry, I'm fidgety. Um, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior. Notice your citizenship for eternity is not Republican or Democrat. Hello, hello. That stuff's all temporary, gonna pass, and you guys are all freaked out and need to stop. And you are not even, your citizenship is not that you're American. I love America. Thank God for America. Pray for America. Pray for our leaders. But listen to me very closely. That's not our eternal destination. This thing's gonna pass. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior. If you really know Jesus if you've really developed a relationship, there's something in you that longs to see him. There's something in you that deep down your prayer should be, come, Lord Jesus, fix yeah. this mess. Yeah. Fix this mess. Just come. Let's just finish it. Let's, let's get on to eternity. He said, for we wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21, this is where I'm going. He says, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Amen. Just stop on that thought. That he will transform our lowly body, our earthly body, and we will be transformed that we will look like his heavenly body. 
The question is, what does that look like? The word transform there is, is a Greek word, and it's, it's a Greek word, metaschematizo, and it, that, I don't know I why I'm sharing that. Just, this Greek word means it's changed. It's still the same, but it's different. It's like if you go to somebody's house and they have cut down all of the trees and they have broke all the siding down and they've bricked it, and now it has new windows and it has shutters and it has a new roof and they've added on this room and it looks there. And you go to that house, you say, well, this is the same house, but it's different. Look at it. It looks so good. I can't believe how much the transformation has done. Notice, it's still the same house. It's not like you went to Damon's house and then all of a sudden you appeared at my house. That's different. That's not what Paul's saying here. He said he's going to transform your body and you will be like his glorious body. So the question I have is, okay, if I'm going to be transformed, I'm going to be like him. What did he look like after he rose from the dead? Is there any scriptures that tell me that? Well, there is. There's a whole bunch. Let's just piece through a few. In John chapter 20. I love this, John chapter 20, verse 11 through 17. Mary is at the tomb. Hear me out. Now listen to me. Listen to me close in context. I use this one first, not because this is the best one, but because this proves the other people who would argue, saying nobody knows what you'll look like, this proves them wrong. This verse, actually, some people will say, well, see, she didn't even know who Jesus was. Actually, I use this just so I could show you that's not true. Watch where Mary's at. Mary... Love Jesus. She watched him. She was there. Come on, it was the women who were there. The men flaked out and ran like chickens. Like we see men running like chickens right now. But the women, thank God for the women, because they're the ones that stood behind and and stood. You know, it's the women who have carried the church and carried our families, because men's been flaky. I'm preaching good girls. It's time to shout. Yeah, come on. It was Mary who hung in there, man. I'll tell you why Mary. Because remember, I mean, Mary, she was living bad, man. And he changed her life. And when they come, got him and arrested him. It was Mary hanging in the back of the crowd watching, crying. It was Mary who watched him pluck his beard out and beat him. It was Mary who watched go through hell. They watched him hang on the cross. Remember, she was the one standing with with Jesus' mama, having her arms around him. Even though their lives are threatened, Mary wasn't leaving, and Mary was distraught. And it's now been three days. And Mary has probably not slept well. I guarantee you she hasn't. She's hurting. She's devastated. Her whole life seems to be over. I mean, everything's fallen apart. Everything she trusted. And all she knew is that he, could t- he changed her life, man. He changed her life, and now he's dead. And ha- she doesn't even understand it. It makes no sense. She's crying. She's freaked out. And now it's Sunday morning. It's the first morning she can actually go to the tomb. She's going because she wants to make sure that he's not defiled and that she buries his body properly. Because they did not let them bury him properly. And, they did, and it was a dishonor. Just like, come on, we honor people who've died. It's important. When you're in a funeral and you see a funeral posse, pull your car over. And all you're doing is honoring somebody. Let's have some respect for somebody. Hello. And she just wanted him to be honored and respect given. She's at the tomb and she's come to prepare his body and to, she goes to the tomb and things don't look how she thinks it should look. She's crying. She's freaked out. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she stepped, and as she stooped down and looked into the tomb, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been, had been. She's freaked out now more. Now somebody stole him. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to him, they've taken, taken away my Lord, and I don't even know where they've laid him. She's devastated. Verse 14. Now when she had said this, she had turned around and saw Jesus standing there, not knowing it was Jesus. I would suggest to you, she turns around and sees him there. She probably is not looking at him in the face. First of all, it's disrespectful for a Jewish woman in that time and age to look at another man in the face. It was in a sense of almost like hitting on him. 
So she's probably looking down. Remember, she's crying. She's freaked out. You ever go through a tragic moment and you're not thinking straight? I mean, I've got those phone calls. I've been. I've seen, you know, so many things happen. You're like, oh, you can't even think. I mean, you're just so overwhelmed and, and freaked out. Mary's at that place. She's not saying Mary, Mary is just freaked out. Not, so watch what takes place. Because there was people, I've heard people say, wow, well, see, she didn't know who he was. Oh, don't, don't finish the story yet. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? Remember, she just seen an empty tomb and there's angels. She don't even know what the heck the angels are. And then she hears this voice. She, supposing him to be the gardener, she knew he was a human. She didn't call him a ghost. She didn't wasn't freaked out by the way the man looked. All right. It wasn't Sylvania Lightbulb guy standing there. <laughs> if you've ever seen that commercial, I think that tells you how old I am. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. You ever see your kids panicked or something happen? You just have to say, hey! <laughs> she turned and said, Teacher, she knew it was him. She knew it was him. Could I suggest to you, she recognized him. She sees him. He's alive. He's in a body. Whoa. Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Verse 17. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. Know this, Jesus has to present the perfect sacrifice unto the Father. Yes. This is the high priest offering. This is the sacrifice of the Lamb. It can't be defiled by earthly things. Jesus has risen from the dead, but yet not ascended up unto the Father. Before this time, Jesus has to present himself, but he'll be back. Yeah. Just give him a couple hours to finish things off here. Listen to me. And Jesus is saying, I'm not, it's not that I'm not real or I don't have bones. Look what he says to her. He says, I'm ascending to my Father, to your Father, and to my God, and to God, my God. God, my God. He's not a ghost. John chapter 20, verse 11 through 17. Watch with me. Now the same day at evening, it's still resurrection morning. Sunday morning, the first day of the week, this is why we meet here. On Sunday morning, it's the first day of the week. This says how you're going to represent the rest of your week and what you're going to live for the rest of the week. It speaks something about what we do. This is the reason we bring our offerings on Sunday morning. We bring our gifts. You should be coming and growing. You should be coming and serving. And, and this says of what your life's going to be like. It's still the first day of the week, Sunday morning, but it's evening. It's just been a few hours. Watch this. Being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assemb assembled, for fear of the Jews, they're, they're hiding. The, the truth of this story is the men were all hiding. It was the women out who were doing. And Mary had to come back and said, look, you bunch of chickens. I went to the tomb, and he wasn't there. And then I seen him. And Jesus came and stood in the midst. Notice the doors were shut. I'm not so sure he walked through the door. I don't know how he got in there at this moment. But there's something about this. Jesus come, stood in the midst of them, and said to them, peace be with you. Verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them his. Does a ghost have hands? Does a ghost have a side? Must have looked almost the same. Because he said, look at my hands. Look at my, look at my side. Look at me. Oh, I love this. Watch this. And the disciples were glad when they, they recognized him. So was Jesus recognizable in his heavenly body? Sure he was. Let's read on. So now Thomas... Called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. We didn't see a ghost. We didn't see somebody else. We've seen him. 
Now remember, we're being transformed. We will be changed, metaschematized into his, to look like him. Watch this. So she said to them, and he said to them, unless I see his hands and the print of his nails, put my finger into the print of his nails, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That just sounds just less some like you. Until I see God, until he tells me, until he speaks to me, I ain't listening to nothing you say. Hello? After eight days, his disciples were again inside. So Thomas said, unless I see him, I'm not going to do. Eight days later, you with me? Jesus in his resurrected body. Can I tell you, he appears for 40 days to hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. After eight days, again, the disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst of them and said, I would suggest to you, he probably just walked right through the walls. What am I saying? I'm telling you, your heavenly body was not be bound to the dimensions that you now live in. Your heavenly body will not be bound to the, just this length or this width or this depth or this height. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1, we see Jesus ascend into heaven, and they all watch him. Whoa! Because yeah. he's in his heavenly body. He's not bound by our earthly right. dimensions. We're stuck here. But there's a day you're going to be pulled out of here. Right. Are you with me? You all right? Yeah. He said, peace to you, verse 27. And then he said to Thomas, Jesus said to Thomas, Jesus appears in the room, and he says to Thomas, because he knew what Thomas had said. He says to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Notice what Jesus said again. Look at my hands. Touch me. You can feel me. I'm real. I'm not a ghost. I am real. Again, our mysticism of this heaven, like this mystical thing. I'll just say this to you. The spiritual is more real than the physical. Just because it doesn't see it doesn't mean it's not real. And he said, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And in verse 28, and Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. There's something very powerful there. I think we probably ought to be able to answer both of those. Number one, many call him Lord, but you ought to, be able to, you ought to also be able to say, my God. Yes. It's easy to come up here and pray a prayer when things are falling apart. It's another thing for him to be God to you on Wednesday night when nobody else is watching. And will you honor him as God? He can be Lord, but he needs to be Savior. He can be Savior, but he needs to be Lord, he needs to be God. That means in every moment, yes. my Lord and my God, fully surrendered. You guys okay? 29, verse 29. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let me just tell you the fact of the matter is. There's been times I'm saying, Lord, just let me see you. I just want to see. Just tell me. You are more blessed if you can walk by faith and trust. Because God works this thing like faith. I hate it. I'd rather he would not work this thing by faith. Personally, I just wish he'd show up and say, I'm God. And either you bow down or you get bumped on top of your head. But he chose to do this thing by faith. And I know it's tough living by faith at times. But when you really learn to walk with faith, you will develop a relationship with the Lord that you could never do if you just see him once. Because here's the problem. If you have to see him every time, you're not really developing a trust. You're not really developing a place where you really have faith. I mean, so many times after you begin to walk by faith, you get used to it and you start learning it and you start saying, hey, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I got, God's got this. I trust him. He's going he's gonna to move. He's going to make it happen. He'll, do, he'll deal with it. So the believers live by faith. He said, and you will be blessed. Remember what he said? You'll be blessed if you read the book of Revelation. Here he said, you'll be blessed if you never see and you believe. You're going to be more powerful in the world when you can look and say, I've not seen him, but I know that I know that I know that he's real. You all right? 
Let's go to the next passage. Let, let me give you another story. This is a story after um, Jesus walked, after uh, um, his resurrected body is real. Now I'm going to give you a story of um, four hours after the resurrection. Again, all I'm simply doing, and this is gonna, it's going to make whole sense here. Hang on here. All I'm simply doing is just going through the appearances when he appears. How he looked, what he looked like. Four hours after his resurrection on the Maus Road in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. Now as he said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. Notice he always says that, what? Can I tell you if he, if he walked in here, you know what he'd say to you? Peace! Stop freaking out about COVID. Stop freaking out about the politics. Stop freaking out about what's going on. He's God. He's Lord. He's got it all. Even though we can't see it all, we don't understand it all, he's got it. Peace to you, he says in the next verse. But they were terrified and frightened that they had seen a... There it is, and I brought it out again. I want you to see somebody say, well, see, they didn't really know him. Oh, wait, you didn't finish the story. Again, they're freaked out. It's the first day. It's four hours later. And they're walking. There's a few guys walking on the road, and all of a sudden, this guy starts walking with them. They're not staring at him in the face. They're not deep detailing him. They're just talking. They're freaked out of everything that's happening. And when you're walking, it's not like you're looking into the eyes of the person next to you. Let's keep on going. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Here's what he's saying. I am me. It's me. He didn't die Jesus and be raised somebody else. He was raised who he was. Handle me and see. Notice, handle me. You can touch. Amen. You will have feelings in heaven. You will touch. You will see people. They recognized him. Let me just tell you, you'll recognize your family. You'll recognize your friends. You'll recognize others around you. Recognition is a real thing. You will know. It's not like you're going to get there and not even know who you were married to your whole life. Know who your kid. Well, I know my kids. Of course, I know your kids. <laughs> Let's read on. Spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed him his hands and he showed him his feet. You all right? Yeah. Now I'm going to go to my favorite one that I wish I would have opened with. Well, let's do this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 36. I'm going to just start in the meat of the subject. You all right? You bear with me here. You all right? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. I think Paul, being nerdy and smart, intelligent, he was just one of those smart guys. I think he's actually dogging us. I think it's actually, this is a teasing moment by Paul. I think Paul actually makes fun of us a little bit because we get so goofy. And so Paul's talking about the resurrection of the dead and people living eternally. And they're asking the question, well, what will my family look like? What will I be like? And so Paul answers, he says, but some will say, how are the dead raised up? How does this happen? How could this be real? Fair. And what body do they come and Paul says in verse 36, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it... Here's what Paul said, you got to die first. And that which you sow, you will also, it will also be brought back up. Actually, there was a Sunday school teacher and she was, she was teaching the kids and saying, okay, how do you get to heaven? And one of the little kids said, my mom and dad said, if I just obey him, then, then I'm going to live. And she said, that's great. That's good. And and, and another little boy raised his hand and said, well, my dad said that I had to do this and I had to do this. And she said, that's all good. And another kid answers, well, I've got to be saved. I've, I've got to pray and ask Jesus in my heart. And the teacher said, that's good. But one little boy just screamed out in the back, you have to be dead first. <laughs> True. <laughs> Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And verse 37 and what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. Here's what Paul is saying. Don't let that be confusing. Paul's saying you don't plant corn and get celery. When corn dies, 
and it goes to the ground. It will develop a seed form, and it will raise back up as corn. Listen, when Pastor Damon dies, he's not going to be resurrected to be Jeremy. He's not going to be something else. When a seed is planted, when a seed dies, it is the law of Genesis, a seed after its own kind. Go back and look at Genesis. It goes over and over and over. A corn will reproduce corn. Wheat will reproduce wheat. Are you with me? Is this making sense? It's the law of its own kind. It's a law that God said. It really destructs reincarnation. Huge. You're not going to be die a man and come back a cat because you didn't act right. It really does something to evolution. Like, when did the dog ever become a dinosaur? Hello, just think about it. Just think about it. Very simple. Not difficult. Verse 38. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. When God created you, listen to me, he was so into you that before you were in your mother, mother and your, fa- your mother's womb, and your father and mother conceived you. You were thought of before that. You were prepared before that. The psalmist says he prepared your bones. He prepared your destiny. He prepared things before you. You were, into, you were uniquely made Amen. and Amen. gifted. Yes. You are powerful how God created you. Before you were even in your mother's womb. The Bible says he called a few of the prophets before they were in their mother's womb and told them, this is what you're going to do and this is who you're going to be. See, eternity starts before you're conceived. And it lasts way past when you die on this earth. Hear me close. Listen to me close here. He gives each seed its own body. What dies also is resurrected. It's just in this metaschematism, this new form, this new shape, but you're not something new. You're still you. You're uniquely you. The Greek word here that I love, each its own body, the word is a dios, I-D-O-S. I don't want to get deep in the Greek, but this word has amazing, amazing thoughts, amazing stuff behind this word. Actually, You know, the New Testament was written in the first century Greek, and the second century changes a little bit the Greek, but this word even develops deeper. It really refers to what we would use the word DNA. Think about this. Your own DNA. You are uniquely you. You are completely you. And though you now have corruption in you because of sin, though we are dying and we're decaying, when this body dies, it will not be raised up a broken down man. It will not be raised up some other man. You will be raised uniquely you, who you are, but in complete perfection. In complete, in a place where it's incorruptible. A place where you will be uniquely you, but in your perfect state of how you should have been before sin entered into your life. A place of DNA. Listen, a place that you're uniquely you. A place that you're privately you. Are you hearing this close? I I pray. It actually says not only completely and properly you, but the word also uses, it also has these ramifications through multiple Greek scholars as I looked this week, and it was was refreshing for me to say it. They said not only does it mean completely and privately and perfectly you, but totally mature. Totally mature. That asks the question, how old will you be in heaven? Well, I don't know, because Adam was made, and he grew to maturity in seconds. But we do know this. He was at a place where he was able to, they were able to multiply. He was at a place of maturity. If you think about Jesus, ministry started when he was how old? 30 years old. You know that they say that men and women probably reach their height, their maturity, their greatest strength when they're somewhere between 25 and 35 years of age. 
I would just suggest to you, you will be mature. You will be complete. You will be at your best, at your best, 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 best. You will not be broken down. And listen to me, if you are crippled here on this earth by some form of a, a birth defect or some form of an accident or some form of whatever it may be, you won't walk into eternity with a hurt shoulder. You won't walk into eternity with a limp. You won't walk into eternity, and I'm believing God for this, with a fat old belly. When I was 30 years old, I didn't have a fat old belly. Well, maybe I did a little bit. But I was better than what I am now. Completely mature. Actually, Philippians 3.21 that we said transformed into his body means in similar. So somewhere we were probably similar to how Jesus was in his earthly ministry. Are you all right? You with me? So let's read on. Let's read through verse 39 through 43. And then we're going we're gonna to do something here. All flesh is not the same flesh. Listen close. But there's one kind of flesh of men. Another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies. That just simply means there's heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. He's been teaching us that. He's using different words so you'll catch it, so you'll catch what he's trying to say to you. And the celestial is one glory and the terrestrial is another. There are days that you have glory here that you're in your maturity and you're complete and life's been good, but that life's decaying. But when you're resurrected, you will be in your fullness. Complete, maturity, perfect. Are you with me? You all right? Watch this. Let's read on. The glory of one is another, and the glory of the other is another. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Remember in context, that's what he's talking about. What will you look like when you're resurrected? The body is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. Sown in corruption but raised in incorruption. Yeah. Yeah. Many times our life on this earth ends with a sickness or a disease, a cancer, a tragic accident, wounded, struggling. But I'm going to tell you something. When you leave this body and you wake up, you're not going to wake up in that broken body. You're not going to wake up in that pain, in that horrible, the, the struggle that you've been. You will be raised in corruption. Verse 43 says this. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it will be raised in power. Actually, if we read just through the Amplified Translation, and let me say this. The Amplified Translation adds words into the Greek. This is not word-for-word -word translation, but sometimes it just helps you see. I love how this reads, how they added some words into here, and I just want to share, may it help you see what we just got done reading through the Amplified Translation. So it is with the resurrection of the, of the dead, the body, that is sown is perishable and it decays, but the body that is resurrected is imperishable, immune to decay. It's immortal. So you got to realize when you go to a funeral, as sad as it is, the person that lays there in that body, I was just an earthly body. They're not in that earthly body anymore. See, listen, we are spirit being. You will live forever. Hear me close, and I'm not going to candy coat this. That doesn't mean you're going to live in heaven forever. You are going to have to accept the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ to get into the door of heaven. Just don't wake up and be in heaven. There are two places. You are an eternal being, but if you don't let somebody pay for your sin, you can't pay for your sin because you're corrupted. You're messed up. What are you going to offer to God? Your brokenness? That's the reason he was perfect. That's the reason he said to Mary, don't touch me. It was a complete, perfect sacrifice that was being offered unto the Father so that we could all be, that we could all move in. Are you Okay. It's immune to decay. It's immortal. Verse 43. Verse 43. It is sown in dishonor and humiliation, but it is raised in honor and glory. It is sown in infirmity and weakness. It is resurrected with strength and endued with power. Hallelujah. Look, endued with power. 
your resurrected body is going to be amazing, amazing, amazing vessel to live inside of. No more tears, no more crying, no more roping around. Look, you are going to be the cream of the crop. You are going to be cruising. It is not something that you want to miss. If Jesus was like that, he said, we will bear the image of the same. Yes. Yes. Actually, when he uses it, well, let me, do, let, me, let me use it in the word. In verse 4, um, where are we? let's keep reading. Keep reading. And I'm, I've got to keep reading. Jonathan, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. It is sown a natural, physical body is raised a supernatural, spiritual body. As surely as there's a physical body, there's also a... Spiritual body. Verse 45. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, an individual personality, but the last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, restoring the dead to life. And thus, but it is not the spiritual what came first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. Hear me out. That's why you have to be born in your physical flesh first. That's why when, the, when, when Nicodemus asked Jesus, what do I got to do to go into heaven? Jesus said, you got to be born again. And Nicodemus said, what are you talking about? i got to go back and be born in my mom's womb again? He said, no, what's natural is first. You first are born in a human birth. You were, were locked into this dimension. But we've all sinned. Hear me out. But you need a spiritual birth. This spiritual birth will wake you up. Yeah. It will open your spiritual eyes. It will change the way we live. The best I could say this, in this earth, your flesh is fleshly minded. But in heaven, you're going to be spiritually minded. You're not going to be desiring the things of the flesh. You're not going to be torn by this, by this battle that we face daily. And we all face it. I'm no different. This week, I stud, I've been studying, and I, I was busy doing things. And, and, and I was, I was, I was put, if you could see my notes, you'd, be, you'd probably freak out because I'm a weirdo. And I have 300 pages of notes and papers all over and but Friday, I'm like, I knew where I wanted to go, but I had not finalized my thoughts. And then Friday, you know, I said, i got to finalize my thoughts. I sit on the table. Next thing you know, my phone rings. I'm talking. Next thing you know, something funny happens. Next thing you know, I'm on Facebook. Don't act like you don't ever do that. Next thing you know, I'm looking at my, my fantasy football team, make sure I win this week. All of a sudden, I realized, you know, man, my flesh just wants to goof around. My spirit said, Dana, get your act together and get done. I literally had to stand up, and I said to myself, I spoke out loud. You will not follow the desires of your flesh, and this is stupid. I am going to focus, and I'm going to sit my hindy down. I use the word butt. Sit my butt down. And you're going to finish this, and you're going to hear from the Lord, and you're going to finish this so you know you're going to have some time to meditate on it and think through it. I had to just discipline myself. I know that's the battle you go through. It doesn't mean you're not normal. This is the battle that we face. But when you get in your heavenly body, my friend, it's going to be different. It's going to be a little bit different. First the physical and then the spiritual. Let's read on here real quickly, Jonathan. i got to hurry. I'm causing trouble. The first man was out of the earth, made from dust, earthly minded. There it is. The second man is the Lord from out of heaven. Now those who are made of the dust are like him who was first made of the dust, earthly minded. And so as the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven, heavenly minded. In verse 49, and just as we have borne the image, I want you to pay attention to the word. Just as we bore in the image of the man of dust, we shall also, we shall, and so let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. The word image is the word icon. It sort of makes sense. You hear it in the Greek. Like a statue. Like an idol. Something you look up to. Can I tell you something? You're going to so look like the Father. You're going to be spitting image of the Father. As a matter of fact, you know, when every, anytime we ever go, one of the pastors will go, somebody has a baby, you show up to the hospital, you know what the first thing is? Who does he look like, pastor? Who does he look like? And, they, and you know that's a trap question. Because a mom wants you to hear you say, and the dad wants to hear you say, and whichever one you say, if you fall into the trap, you can just see him smile, looks just like me. Looks just like me. You know, really, the Greek saying here, you're going to be the splitting image of your heavenly father. Amen. 
You're going to look like his child. Everybody's going to know you are a part of the family. We walk into a spiritual body that is one of the most amazing things that you can ever imagine. I think, as a matter of fact, that's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Let me just give you a few things here. Number one, and, and i got to do this quickly. I'm not going to give you, I'll give you the scripture. You'll have to read them yourself. He defied gravity. We talked about that. Went in buildings, went out of buildings, rose. He disappeared. Let me tell you this. You're going to eat in your heavenly body. Yeah, somebody say amen. That's a good thing. You're going to eat in your heavenly body. Oh, don't think I'm crazy. Listen, why did Jesus say, I invite you to the, he didn't say wedding alone. He said the wedding supper. He could have just said wedding if that was what it was about. But not only will we be sitting at a table with the Lord, there will be eating that will be done with the Lord. As a matter of fact, we see Paul preaching in Cornelius, or Peter is preaching in Cornelius' house. Most of you probably have never paid attention to this passage. Peter is preaching in Cornelius' house, and he's telling about how Jesus rose from the dead and the story. And let's pick it up, Acts 10, 40, verse 41. I've got to show this passage. And Peter says to the family, Him God raised on the third day, talking about Jesus, and showed him openly. God the Father showed Jesus openly. And watch this, verse 41. Not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Do you remember the story where Jesus is on the shore and they're freaked out? The guys have all run back to their own things. Peter's out fishing and got all the fishing crew. And he's freaked out. And Jesus walks to the shore They've been fishing all night, haven't caught tiddlywinks. I don't know how, but Jesus has already got fish, got a fire, barbecue in the fish. <laughs> Screams out, hey! How many fish you catch? <laughs> he knew they hadn't caught any. Peter caught wind. Oh my, it's him. The Bible says Peter so freaked out, he jumped out of the boat and began to run. The rest of the disciples come in. The story finishes that Jesus not only cooked fish for them that day, but that he sat and ate with them on the beach. You will eat in heaven. Heaven will be a place of amazing fun. Listen, there's fruits in heaven, and it says the fruits are for the healing of the nations. We'll talk about the healing of the nations later, but why have fruits if you're not going to eat them? Are you all right? Will you remember people? Of course you're going to remember people. If When you get to heaven, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, it comes down. On the walls are the names of the 12 disciples of the 12 tribes of Israel. Why put their names there if nobody remembers who they are? I mean, why you put the names there and nobody remembers? Like, well, who the heck's that? Why does he put their names? Because you must remember who they are. As a matter of fact, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Jesus said to them, some people say, well, it's just a story. It's just a parable. I don't think he, he never, ever named a parable of people. He gave them specific names. But this is what he says. He says to Lazarus, or he says to the rich man, remember, Lazarus was struggling and you weren't. Remember? Of course you're going to remember. Of course you're going to know people. Of course we're going to be around one another. Of course we're going to walk in this city. Revelation 6 verses 8 through 11 simply say this. It's the witnesses that were, that were killed in the tribulation. And what is their cry? Lord, remember what happened to us? And Jesus said, just wait. Remember the story is? He said, just wait. I'm going to fix this. But they had already died, were already in heaven, and they had remembered what happened to them on the face of the earth. Are you all right? You okay? How about recognizing? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, it says this. Jesus appeared to over 500 people. In a period of 40 days, he appeared to over 500 people. They all knew he was the real deal. They all knew he was real. They all knew he was alive. They all knew he lived in a body. What about Revelation chapter 7? We know this. Look at this. And after these things, I look and behold a multitude which no one could number talking about people in heaven. Look at them. Watch this close. A number of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues. You're going to be uniquely you. If you're dark now, you'll be dark then, my friend. 
If you're light, you'll be light now, my friend. You'll understand God created you perfect just how you are. Don't let anybody else tell you what you should look like or some race is better than somebody else or some ethnicity is some. God created you uniquely, perfectly you. You are beautiful. You were created just how God wanted you. Don't buy into all this racism, think people are better. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all messed up. We need to realize you are you. you. God created you just who you are. You don't need to change your sex. You're complete who you are. God made you male. You're a male. That's who God created you to be. You're beautiful like that. Revelation chapter 5 tells us the same thing of our ethnicity. Let me say this. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was there and the disciples watched, remember two people appeared. Do you remember who they were? Moses and Elijah. Do you notice the disciples knew him? Knew their names? The disciples recognized them. When you wake up in heaven, it's going to be a party like you've never imagined before. It's going to be an experience like we've never. Don't get too caught up in this flesh because this thing is decaying. This thing is dying. This thing is filled full of sin. But as Christians, we should not be scared of death because we're going to wake up into a body this is going to be something that you've never imagined before. And as I close today, as i got to be done, I'm way over time. May I say this to you? If you don't know Jesus, I'm praying with all of my heart. You'll open your heart to Jesus this morning. I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about a relationship. I'm not talking about joining the blended church. Thank God you're here. I want you to be a part of this family of believers. But being at the blended church is not going to get you into heaven. You can't wake up and say, well, I went to church. Daner was a pastor. He said, well, Daner was a goofball. That's got really nothing to do with this. You've got to have a relationship with Jesus through the door. There's one door in heaven. In these days that we're moving into, they're going to call us closed-minded. But I'm telling you, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm telling you, Jesus is the only one that I know that's died and has risen from the dead. Christianity is not a religion because religion tries to teach you good and how you can get there through your goodness. Christianity teaches you you can't get there through your goodness. It's only through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus that you have avenue into heaven. If you don't have that relationship today, no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've blown it, no matter how many times you've lied, no matter how many times you've sinned, no matter what you've done, you can be forgiven today in a relationship with Jesus. We'll be here at the altar to pray for you, Pastor Damon, and there'll be a lot of people to pray for you here today. I pray today you walk out of here, go look through some of the passages and read through. Let God speak to you about a place. I think we need to become a church that would be heavenly minded, that we could live an earthly good. Father, we'll give you the glory and the praise as you move on the hearts of people. Thank you. We look forward to the day, as Paul said, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, God. Speak to them. Give them faith and strength this week. God, encourage them, God, as they walk out, God, into a troubled world to be a light in a broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen.